Thank you, Father. Loving Father. Lord, we just come and sit at your feet. Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, I pray for transformational encounter, Lord, in our lives. Lord, may we not walk out of this room the same. I pray for deposits, God, of your spirit, of your son, Lord, into every life and everybody listening. Lord, grace John, Lord, with anointing to speak and to declare and proclaim, Lord, your heart, your spirit, God. Lord, we want to hear and we're jealous for the voice. Lord, there's only one voice. Lord, we pray for that voice. We pray for the life of Christ, Lord, to penetrate every other voice, every other name, everything that would rise up against the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, let the sword of your spirit come out tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Just a really, very beautiful, sweet presence of God here. Just, um, I know it's just because of all the mothers have been blessed. and So when the mothers are happy, everything's all good in the land. Just a, a precious, precious uh, sense of the presence of God. Anyway, um, so blessed with everything that's been said already. Uh, just the worship time, worship. What Andrew just shared. Uh, Chris's sermon, not sermon. Just can't help. Just <laughs> from the abundance of the heart, the, the mouth will speak. Uh, it's all so precious, you know. So awesome. So um, yeah, just an add of my little two cents or. Not my two cents, I'll just give what the Lord has. Um, so uh, I kind of feel like I need to pray as well. Sorry, I just, <laughs> I don't know, it just feels more official when I pray as well. So I'm just going to pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you for your love, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, your precious word, for who you are, Father, and for who you are, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I, um, like always, I really have no idea what I'm doing up here, but Holy Spirit, you are the teacher, you're the speaker. Your word is life and powerful, Father. So we just make way and ask that you would come. And as Chris said, just sow and deposit, Lord. Um, deposits from your son, Lord, into every life, every heart. Lord, life comes from you alone, Lord Jesus. We look to you, not to anything else. Holy Spirit, have your way. Just bless and speak to us, Lord. Let your presence come and touch and speak deep into our spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I just thought better touch on the fact that <clears throat> A few of us were at a, a conference in Singapore a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to talk about that tonight, but just, just touch on the fact that we were there. And uh, um, as usual, when you go to a gathering that you believe is ordained from the Lord, you're not just hopping around the place and the next um, thing that just caught your eye on, on some brochure, then the Lord will speak and he will impact your life. And so um, just very briefly, I think the main thing, somebody asked me during the week, what was, what's one thing that you got from that conference in Singapore? And uh, it had a very end times focus, and it's something that I'm not certainly no expert on. I've never ever sort of really had a big interest in those, those types of things. But um, I think Cheryl just said it really well last week. It was about the focus was really about just positioning ourselves, our hearts, our lives for what the Lord wanted to do in these times, not just you know, hundreds of years off in the distance or even 20 years, but but right now, positioning our, our lives for what um, for what the Lord wants to usher into the earth, into the body of Christ, and, and throughout the world. So it was, it was awesome, it was impacting. But um, my summary was, uh, one thing that got away was it's just like everything that we've ever heard or taught or learnt as far as Christian principles, values, and, and the following the Lord Jesus, just like everything, just somebody just got the dial and just turned up the intensity. It was just the intensity dial, just everything got raised, like another 20 or 30 you know, notches. It was, you know, you got these sliders on the, on the sound desk at the back. It's like so the Lord just went... I just could push the whole lot up, all of them, and uh, and I felt like you know, it was just um, I had to go away and just spend a lot of time with the Lord just to, to unpack and, and really um, chew on and, and understand exactly the fullness of what was was downloaded to us at that time. So that's what I've been doing for the last, trying to do the last couple of weeks. So uh, this message is not about uh, f- from subjects from the, um, the conference so much, but more of, I guess of an overflow of the impact of it on my, on my life and I believe it just runs very much in 
uh, dovetails in with what's already been shared with Pastor Chris and with Andrew, the worship, and I'm sure with everything else that's been, probably others have been saying during the week, or the Holy Spirit's been saying to your own lives. And I, I really just acknowledge that message last Sunday too. That was just, that was just awesome. <laughs> it's like, I was sitting there thinking, yeah, I'm never going to get up there again. There's just like, the bar is so high now. <laughs> and then next week. Oh, yeah. Anyway, it's all good. So, um, having a real good psalm fest at the moment, and it's, it's wonderful, it's precious, and uh, I know everyone's been really impacted by the series that Chris is doing on the, 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 um, the heart of David. Powerful, right? It's um, just so much that, you, that doesn't immediately spring to mind when, when you think of David, but it's being unpacked, so it's awesome. So I want to turn to Psalm 84. How many, I'm just going to ask this question, how many people here have a ESV Bible? A couple. Yeah? The rest will have an altar call later, for those who don't. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm not ESV only. I'm not KJV only as well. I remember a, pastor, a preacher saying, um, he was sharing from the King James Version, and he wanted to know who had King James Version, so he, those who didn't, he said, you don't have to get to heaven, you don't have to read the King James to get to heaven. There will be one given to you at the door when you come in. So he's like, <laughs> and he said, just joking, just joking. So I've said, I just thought, if anybody ever asked me, are you a King James only? I'll say, no, I'm a King Jesus only. And so I read the Bible only to find Jesus, you know, nothing else. So any version you've got, say, I want Lord, I'm seeking King Jesus only. And, and to be honest, you, I believe you need to seek through several versions to really uh, get a better, clearer picture of King Jesus. So if you're not looking for King Jesus, it doesn't matter what version you look at, you're going to read, you're not going to get life. If you're just looking for information, so King Jesus only. <clears throat> All right, so let's just start. So this, um, this psalm, Psalm 84, was given to us by the Holy Spirit through the sons of Korah. So it's not one of David's. Sons of Korah have written, we've got, of the 150 psalms that we have in the Bible, the sons of Korah wrote 12 of those. <clears throat> uh, psalm 84 being one of them. So just, just before we even get on to the psalm, the sons of Korah themselves, so if, you, if, you know, if you're familiar with the name Korah, it's mentioned in Jude, not in a good way. So he's one of the guys that um, was working with Moses and, and Aaron, and he led 250 people in a rebellion against the leadership at the time. It did not bode well for Korah. <laughs> Literally the earth opened up and he went down, along with a couple of other guys, Dathan and Abiram I think it was. And he was never to be seen again. <clears throat> so for these guys to say, we are the sons of Korah, we're the worship leaders, but we're the sons of Korah, was like, every time you mention that name, it's like, you know, like awkward silence, sons of Korah, don't mention, don't talk about it. But it's just, a, what a blessing, you know, that it was so well known, the whole history of, that, of, the, of their ancestor was known. And yet the, I think this is, um, a guy called Heman is one of the, the song Song leaders that was appointed by David. So he had very much, obviously, had a very similar heart to David, but he was the song leader. He, worked, he wrote, <coughs> um, so when you sing, see, see Psalms for the choir master, it was probably one of the sons of Korah who was writing those things out, preparing them for the temple worship. So just a great thing that despite what our, our forefathers have done, our father, our, maybe our immediate father, if they've messed up, <coughs> it does not cancel. We don't have to walk in the footsteps, the mistakes, the errors of that thing. So the sons of Korah went on to be absolutely precious servants of God who brought amazing, genuine worship into the temple. So before we even started, there's a message just in that, right? <clears throat> and then it just flows. And some of the most beautiful psalms that are, that are in, that we've got, are from these guys. This is one of those, uh, one of those psalms where probably multitudes of worship songs have been written. So it starts with, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. So I just, just felt so blessed with what Andrew was saying. It's just like, this just rolls straight off the back of everything you just said. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you 
And whose heart are the... Okay, hang on. We just <clears throat> If you don't have an ESV, just listen up. It says, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. So we just stop right there. And whose heart are the highways to Zion? So other versions will say, who've set their heart or set their mind on, on pilgrimage. This is in whose heart are the highways to Zion. And that has been arresting me for the last couple of weeks. It's like, some people say, you know, verse, that verse really stuck out to me. It's like that verse grew arms, reached out, grabbed both my ears, slapped me across the face a few times, and said, somebody declare this word, you know? I was like, wow, in whose heart are the highways to Zion? It's just a, such a powerful statement. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. She seems to be dying up here. Um, and so it just, it just says so much in, in one statement. It's, it's not an outward thing. It's not an outward trying to conform to um, all my, my Christian Christianese, my Christian no do's and don'ts, and what I know is right and wrong. It's, it's the highways are in my heart. It's already in there. And to me, that's when Chris talks of fullness, immediately when I was reading this verse, my, my mind went to uh, the church in Ephesus is written in, the, in Revelation where the Lord Jesus was rebuking the church and said, look, you've left your first love. And, um, and to me, that having those highways and allowing the Lord to establish his highways in our heart, that is, that's, that is a fruit of first love. It's where our highways have been done away with and we've allowed the Lord to, to put his ways, his, uh, everything about him in our lives. Um, yeah, look, powerful. Anyway, so highways don't just come from, you know, you think of a beautiful sign like this, and you think it's just all so lovely, and we're just going to sprinkle roses, rose petals out, and that's going to be the highway for the Lord. So I work in Cleveland, and every day I go over the Gateway Bridge, and at the moment they are working on the highway. And they've got big earth group moving machines with great big buckets and teeth, and they're gouging and they're ripping and it's inconvenient, and they're diverting people, and they're just changing things. What used to be a perfectly good highway it was, it was too small. So they're expanding it, they're changing it, they're diverting it. And so at the conference, um, I'm not talking about the message, but part of what, what I was, I was convicted there on a couple of issues in quite a big, big way. And one of them was, um, like my heart was, you know, the worship times was full of worship, and but one, there was one particular session, and I just knew it was like the Holy Spirit came up and said, oh, not in an accusing way, but I just felt, I just knew, I'm not as close to the Lord as I should be. I'm not, my, my relationship with you, Lord, is not as close as it could be and as it should be, one. And two, there's some really on oh, fire people at that place. And it's, you know, it's not a good thing to compare yourself with others. But, um, but I just, another thing I felt was, there was such an intensity there and such a call to greater consecration. It was like I knew I could have been further down the road as far as bearing fruit in my own life. And there was like a, there was like a cutting. I was talking about you know, these, these earth-moving earth um, machines on the, on the motorway. And my mind went to verse Psalm 42, which is also one of the, Psalms, the sons of Korah. And you know the verse that says, uh, Deep calls to deep at the, at the roar of the water spouts. All your, it says, all your waves and breakers have, have gone over me. And I, um, that verse came to mind, and I thought, that's a, you know, that's a precious thing. The only other time that, that phrase is used is with Jonah. Not one of the guys that we want to emulate, you know. <laughs> but where he was in the whale on the bottom of the ocean, he says, all your waves and breakers have gone over me. He was in a place of, uh, of the dealing of God. And for these highways to be put into our lives, you know, it, um, there is a cutting, there is a, there, there's a graciousness, there's a love. But it can also be a time where, um, particularly where I believe the Lord wants to expand our lives, expand our hearts, expand even our capacity for hunger. You know, we can be hungry one day, but the Lord says, that's not, I've called you to more. And so he wants to expand even our capacity to be hungry for him. So just like we're changing, are expanding a highway down here from whatever it was, two or three lanes to four lanes and five lanes. The Lord wants to expand all of us to a greater level of maturity, a greater capacity for hunger, a greater desire that, that nothing else will get in my way. I will pursue this Lord for the word that Chris said, fullness. And so there was like a, there was a cutting that was um, happening in my life, but at the same time, an absolute loving hunger and drawing is like do whatever. I, mean, I just sent finished the series last month, um, a series of time 
I can't remember. I spoke, said to a few people there, where I actually said, Lord, bring your discipline into my life. Bring your, um, bring your correction. And I was actually asking them all because I just knew. I just, I was hungry, but I knew there needed to be something uh, deeper. And I, there was nothing I could particularly knew that I would put my finger on to, to correct. I just saying, Lord, just, I just need uh, your correction to come into my life. So a few weeks later, there I was in Singapore, and there was a spirit of correction coming. God answers prayer. So, um, <clears throat> so it's wonderful. In whose heart the highways of the, of the Lord. So let's just go on to verse, uh, verse 6, <clears throat> same, same psalm. As I go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. So uh, Baca, some versions will actually say there's a valley of weeping. And me being a simple man, I always said, try and go and find out the meanings of words like Andrew. So that's what Baca literally means, the valley of weeping. As I go through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs. The early rains also cover it with pools. So just an encouragement. Where the Lord is, where you feel that the Lord is bringing some stretching, some, some challenging some, uh, some breaking, some, some laying of some foundations of new roads or whatever it is. Uh, so Proverbs says that you know, weeping may endure for a, for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If we, if we, like it says in Hebrews, that no discipline is, no discipline is joyful for the moment. It's just not. When the, when the Lord is really dealing with issues in your heart, don't expect it to be the most fun time in the world. It says it's not um, pleasant. But... It says it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So there's a training which the Lord brings in all of this stuff. So that's one side. And then there's, there's, the, there's the weeping that comes from our own foolishness, from making wrong decisions. This is clearly that we reap what we sow. But even if, that, even if we bring our foolishness and our, our, our stupidity, our mistakes to the Lord, you know, he, he says, whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out, just knowing that, Lord, I bring this, <clears throat> my issues, my mistakes, whatever, I've done this, I don't know how many times, <laughs> like others, I'm, I guess. And even in that, the Lord can work in those. You know, there is mercy with God, there is forgiveness that he may be feared. And we can still turn even the mistakes into a place, where it says here, a place of springs, where the early rain covers it with pools. And then if that wasn't good enough, go on to verse 7. It says, they go from strength to strength, each one, uh, actually I'm not sure what other versions say, but, just put your seatbelts on because it says, they go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. Wow. That's worthy of a wow. <laughs> and that's the whole goal, right? If the highways in our heart are taking us to one place to meet Him, then our highways are wrong. We need to change them, right? In our, in our heart. And just actually, I'll just, what is it? Um, Hebrews chapter 12, it literally says, so it's talking about, because obviously this is in a period of the old, old temple, under the old covenant, the first covenant, and they were in Zion, the place uh, where God was worshipped. But Paul, or, or the Hebrew, writer of Hebrews, in, Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 12, he just says it very clearly, um, and in making the difference, you've not come to Mount Sinai, you've not come to this covenant, but you have come to Mount Zion. So he's talking to new covenant believers. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable, innumerable Angels in festival gathering. So sometimes I can think, wow, this is just all so spiritual, just taking parallels out of the Old Testament and kind of getting a big message out of it. But it's literally, as Paul is saying, this is literally what we've done. We have come to that heavenly place, that spiritual realm, Zion, where, where it says here that all um, will appear before him in Zion. <sighs> so we just park on that for a little while. And again, just uh, everything that Andrew just talked about that secret place. That's, that's what it's all about, coming before him. And there's the comfort, there's the encouragement, and there's love. And this needs to be, obviously, for us a daily, every day, an everyday occurrence, appearing before God in Zion every day. We don't always, but there's no reason why we can't. The door is completely open, right? And so just think of um, the fact that it's not just us appearing before him, how much more we want him to appear before us. <clears throat> and we can do that to some measure, and, and it's a, and absolutely essential that every day in the Word um, that, we, that he appears before us, that the Word is washing, that the Word is challenging, that the Word is correcting us. Every day we, we are appearing before him, and he is appearing before us. And in the light of his Word, the light of his Holy Spirit's presence, he's 
speaking to us, challenging us, redirecting us, doing exactly what Andrew was saying, just wait five minutes or wait ten minutes. It was just excellent. Um, the thing is that when he appears before us, just think of the big appearances like the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle, and he hadn't the Lord appeared before him. And for three days he was blind and went into immediate prayer and fasting. As I six, the Lord appeared before him. And these are kind of like all the things that we want, right? We want those big, big encounters. Um, Apostle John on the, on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord appeared before him, and he, I don't know how many times it says, does anyone know how many times it says in Revelations that he fell on his face as I did? Because every time the Lord or an angel or somebody spoke to him, it was like, bang. <laughs> bang, get out, John. Yeah. It's the Lord appearing before us. But the one thing that really came to mind is, is actually John chapter 10. So it talks about the sheep, so we're going to just duck out, jump out of Psalm 84 for a second. Because the thing with, uh, and we know this so well probably from Sunday school for many of us, that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He also says, I am the, I am the door. The one, uh, by me, if any man enters, he shall be saved. No one comes to the Father but by me. So that's in each an individual one. So you get the picture in Zion where there's thousands and thousands of people in Israel gathering before the Lord and they each appear before him. But it all comes down to this when you don't get through the door unless there's that one-to-one face-to-face encounter. That each and every one comes individually through that door, through that, the person of the Lord Jesus. And that, that just really hit me too, this, this um, issue of the, the one by one, each and every one, each individual encounter, each and every... There's not one person that will be in heaven or is in heaven that is not that the Lord doesn't know personally, hasn't met, greeted, welcomed, know everything about, show them the way where they've engaged in that level of I am the door and by me. And so I want to believe for another dimension of this whole issue of the highways in heaven is this being sheep-like. So I just need to dwell on that because I just sort of felt really impressed. Um, and the thing with sheep, uh, actually we'll just go Psalm 100, because that speaks a lot about sheep too. Just in one verse it says, I think it's verse Psalm 100 verse 3, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So it all sounds very nice. Something you'd see in Kurong, a nice big poster. <laughs> fluffy ducks and fluffy wool and sunshine and rainbows, you know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but the thing with sheep, you know, it's like we hear in Christian circles, we hear of the lion of the tribe of Judah. We want to be bold as a lion. And everybody goes, yeah. Or we want to be like the prophetic eagle with the eyesight and talons to destroy the enemy and beaks and yeah. But sheep is like, mm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Melvin is the the, the um, local expert on, on military issues in history. Can you name one army that has ever chosen the sheep for its logo and its emblem and gone into battle? Yeah, the sheep. <laughs> Not the you know, okay. Melvin doesn't know it. It's it's. It, Hidden under sheep. That's because sheep look so docile and so dopey. <laughs> wow. There we go. Oh, yeah, or the ram at the front of the boat or something. And so I just, uh, just, just felt the touch on this, this whole thing with the sheep. So one, one is the Lord says that these are, my, um, these are my people, my sheep. They belong to me. So immediately one up. It's just a loss of... of Ownership. I mean, this is this is very very simple stuff, but I believe it's so important, um, and it will get to why in, in eventually. So just one of is that first of all, just uh, relinquishing our ownership over ourselves, self control. The whole thing is that we are the Lord's. We are His. We are His people. That's it. We, our ownership is given over to Him. Two is. Um, <coughs> 
It's just absolute dependence on him. So you don't see here much about wild sheep because they just don't last. They get eaten by wolves or they just get disease-ridden or whatever. So out of domesticated sheep, they are just absolutely dependent on the, on the shepherd. Um, I watched a couple of YouTube clips last night after I got home late. had a good time of fellowship at the coast with John. Thanks, man. That's good. Um, that's last night. So, so I looked, at, looked up a couple of YouTube video clips of, because I've heard this thing about my sheep know my voice, and I've never actually seen that. I thought, is that real? You know, do sheep actually know the shepherd's voice? And so the first clip I, I saw was a sheep, I think it was actually in America, not New Zealand, surprising. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think this guy was, was bringing tourists onto his farm for, you know, just maybe extra cash or something. And so there was a, you see this, and he was getting people to go up and to, getting to call the sheep. So one, one of these young ladies got up, I think she's an Asian young lady, got up and she was yelling out, like, you know, and sheep just munching, 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 just as zero change. And then another lady got up, she was yelling out, just all this, trying to be a farmer and yelling all these um, noises and not, no change. So eventually the farmer got up and he just, just yelled out once, right, whatever he said, I don't know what sheep language. And immediately, it was just hilarious. This is, so you've got this hillside, like this, it's scattered all over, we'll say 100 sheep, because that sounds biblical. But it probably was about 100. <laughs> and as soon as he, he said, it's like, his heads just went up. It was so funny, like I've never seen sheep move so fast. As <laughs> and it's so true, they just recognized his voice. And then he just kept calling them, and they just all turned and started running down the hill. It was hilarious. And I just watched two or, two or three more videos very similar. So sheep, they really, it's not just a spiritual thing, it's true. They're sheep and they know the voice. Yeah. And the other thing is that they, um, sheep are very, they're grazers. They just, all they do is just eat the grass that's in front of them, the clovers, and that's it. Very, um, very herd, animal, herd orientated, they stick with the group. And so we know in Matthew 25, that um, Jesus said at the end of the age, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? So there's this, why are the goats so nasty? Why do they get into heaven? So just looking at the very, the very basic characteristics, um, and if you look at pretty well any website on the on the internet, they'll all tell you the same thing. What I just told you about sheep and goats, on the other hand, same general family, um, but they're independent. They're not grazers; they're browsers. So they'll eat a bit here, they'll go eat a bit there, they'll go eat a bit over there, up there, around there, all over the place. Um, it does give them a better diet, but what it doesn't give is a, a resilience to the parasites that are in the, in the grass. So when they do eat them, they're more susceptible for disease. Yeah. <clears throat> so because the, the sheep just, that's where they hang out, it's just on the grass. They've got this resistance in them to the parasites that, that are around on that, um, on that type of material. Whereas goats aren't. Uh, what else about goats? Goats can look like sheep, and sheep can look like goats. There are some goats that don't have wool. They have hair in uh, the Caribbean, believe it or not. <clears throat> but anyway, just some lessons from this. Um, as far as goats being browsers, just uh, I don't know how many Christians in this last couple of weeks, literally in the last couple of weeks, have come up with just, I've just heard the weirdest stories and ideas of what they believe is Christianity and Christian faith. There's a girl, um, a friend I know from overseas, um, way overseas, I haven't seen for a long time. She sent me this thing about the Flat Earth documentary. <clears throat> this is no joke. And she said, and it was a serious question, what do you think, what do you think about this? I was just wasn't sure, so I thought I'd better check with other unbelievers. And I was horrified. That was a serious question. It was like a one and a half hour documentary done professionally with a really convincing sounding narrator and all those amazing graphics and, and Saying, saying it's so scientific, pulling out scriptures, diagrams, backing up scriptures, saying the earth is flat and everything else is a demonic deception that the whole world is in as part of the whole Babylonian end of, end of world system. I was thinking, dear Lord. So, I, I, so this is the thing with browsing, where people just browse. So that was one, that was just a few days ago. So I already replied and just said, dear sister, <laughs> um, fix your eyes on Jesus, just on the will of God, on, the, on his presence on, the, on, his, on his word and please stay way away from all this stuff. Another really big one is we were talking about last night about um, the attraction to, uh, to go back to 
seemingly Hebrew things or messianic, like this, this word messianic things, where it's actually just encouraging people to, get, to um, put a yoke of the law back on them. And I'm not saying it's not, not a yoke of godliness. Like there's a difference between holiness and just legalism. Um, like observing the Sabbath strictly, you know, like in a legal sense, or um, saying that they, you cannot use the name of Jesus, you must use the name Yeshua. You know, like Yeshua is, is correct as is the right name, but it's not, um, it's not to say that we need to not use the name Jesus, and, and it just goes further and further. But it's, that's going like wildfire around the globe. And I'm aware, aware just how many people are being uh, pulled into this sort of stuff. And again, it's just anything. So that verse that we said in, in Psalm 84, they... Uh, talks about all the highways designer in their heart, and eventually says that they all appear before him in Zion. So anything that doesn't bring you to the person, it doesn't, is the one goal is to bring you before the Lord Jesus, who is the image of the Father. If it, if it just takes us off onto some religious spiritual track or some intrigue, or especially a lot of these groups, another friend of mine uh, somewhere else in Australia, who uh, just seems to me this quite exclusive little group, and it's so easy to think well, we've got this higher revelation and we're just kind of we're just a bit ahead of everyone else. We don't put them down, but we don't really want to fellowship with them either, you know. And it's just, a, it's just another a thin edge of a wedge of deceptions, of going off onto other things rather than keeping the focus, the focus of the presence of Jesus, the Lord God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, fellowship. So it's the one thing with the herds is they're less likely to get off into the feeding on weird stuff if they're just part of the group, part of the fellowship, being staying with with the, with the gang. Um, so yeah, so sheep and goats. But um, just, yeah, just close pretty quickly actually. So just with the, the whole thing with the sheep, um, character, nature, the dependence, I just really felt the Lord saying, so the, um, the one verse that really has come that I've come away with, and it's been on my heart for, for years, but it's kind of like been inflamed with new intensity. I mentioned it last Sunday when we were doing communion, where Peter was, uh, where the Lord Jesus restored Peter in John 21, and he said, "You know, do you love me, Peter?" And he said, "Yes, Lord, of course. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. You know I do. Tend my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord. You know I do. Feed my sheep." And uh, just this whole emphasis on the Lord speaking into Peter's life, restoring him, and just depositing such a revelation of the absolute, powerful, unconditional, restoring love of the Lord Jesus, spoken into Peter. There's a man who's never, ever, ever going to forget the power of the love of, God, of Jesus, right? But saying, but this is the very thing that I want, in saying that, this is how I'm interpreting it, this is how it's hit me, where he's saying, um, feed my sheep. It's the very revelation of Peter knowing that he is the absolute most worthless, uh, nothing good in his own self that can ever credit himself, get him through the door of heaven outside of everything that only that Lord Jesus has done. He knows where he is. And yet that is the very thing, the revelation that he's telling Peter to, the, to feed his sheep with is this covenant sacrificial love of the shepherd who's laid down his life for the sheep. This is the thing that you need to speak into the lives of others. This covenant love. And uh, at, at the conference, there was a, an opportunity that Sadi gave people just to renew your personal covenant, your, your understanding of covenant relationship with the Father. And this, that wasn't the first time. It's, um, it's other conferences, and it's happened. I've felt the Lord say that personally to me many times. Um, and I believe if there's one thing that... Um, it's got a more personal calling, but that's, that's kind of what I feel every time I want to speak to somebody. This is the goal, is the revelation of the covenant, a personal covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for you. That needs to be sown into their heart. There's nothing else. And at the end of the day, it comes back to this Psalm 84. All, um, all the highways design are in the heart. As if, this, if the covenant, if, if the understanding, the revelation of who Jesus is, that covenant love, if that's sown, if that hits the person's heart, those highways will be established. There will be a, a walk and a stability and a faithfulness in that person's life that will not settle for anything else but the person of Jesus himself, personal encounter, nothing else. Everything else can go. Every other religious activity can be destroyed, but this one thing um, must be present. And the other thing is just a greater, um, no matter how sheep-like we think we already are, 
it's just a growing and a greater sensitivity. Like just, um, just the hearing, again, of the voice. We just know that's the quintessential thing of John 10, is my sheep hear my voice. But I just believe the Lord's saying, look, there's a greater level of dependency, a greater level of sensitivity, a greater level of hearing. So just driving around the last, few, last week, actually, just felt several times just prompted by the Holy Spirit, just ask, ask Jesus now. What, 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 so what are you thinking, Lord? Just asking, inviting him into, the, into your space, asking what's on your heart? What do you want to talk about now? What do you want to... What do you want to do? What do you want to speak about? Just expanding that area of personal closeness, relationship, sensitivity, um, to giving him room to, to grow in that, that personal walk. So, um, I think that's about it. Just one last verse. In Psalm, 50, it's Psalm 50, verse 23. I don't know who wrote this psalm, but it says that the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way aright, rightly, I will show the salvation of the Lord. So I just love that. Just, just the, the little steps that we know to take. If we, if we order um, things that we know rightly, where the Holy Spirit is prompting us, we, we're faithful to respond to those things. And we start putting into order those little issues that God talks to us. He says, I will show the salvation of God. I will show more. As you begin to respond to those things, Mark 4.24 says that, um, he said, pay attention to what you hear. So it's, again, this is hearing. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. So sometimes we think, God, where are you? If we have a habit of neglecting or not responding to what we know the Holy Spirit is saying to us, before long you won't be able to hear much at all and need to repent. Say, so God, where I've hardened my heart, my ears, I repent. So it's from the exercise of doing what we know, from the hearing that we've heard, that sensitivity grows and hearing increases. So... Amen. Well, I'm going to pray, and then I think I'm going to bless the mums. Good day, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris and Cheryl, and again, so Father, we just um, thank you for your Word, Lord. We thank you for your, and your lessons, for your teaching and instructions in your Word, Father. And we just pray that the reality of that, Lord, beyond my own speaking, but Lord, the reality of your your Spirit, your truth, your Word, would um, would be settled, Lord, and sown into our hearts, Father. That that, Lord, we hear individually, each one of us, respond and know exactly what you're saying to us, Lord. Come to that place of deeper intimacy and closeness in our own personal walk and fruitfulness with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Just ask for a greater level of sensitivity in all of our lives, Father God, that we would come to that place daily of seeing you, of knowing you, fellowshipping, hearing your voice, hearing your spirit, and growing in all of your ways. In Jesus' wonderful name.